Hola, and welcome to Vive Nutrition Radio, the first ever Spanglish podcast where you will hear interviews with the top minds in nutrition, performance, fitness, and health in both English and Spanish. Here is your host, expert registered dietitian, Andres Ayesta, on a mission to help you take your nutrition to the next level. Hope you're ready for this. Let's dive right in. Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Vive Nutrition Radio. Um, here's your host, Andres Ayesta. Today's topic and conversation was awesome. And I'm excited to bring it to you because I had the chance to interview one of my good friends and colleagues, um, Nicole Rodriguez. She's a, a fellow dietitian and also a personal trainer. Um, she is a wife. Um, she's married to uh, Puerto Rican. That's where the last name came from. I thought she was actually Latina, but she does, as you will listen to, um, can spit some words in Spanish. So super excited about that. But you'll actually know her too because uh, she's a disco funk enthusiast. Knows over all of her whole workouts that she posted on her Instagram. Uh, do you usually have those like a little bit of that? old school 80s and 90s um, background in it. So it's pretty awesome. But besides obviously being into disco funk and um, being a mother and a dietitian, she is a huge advocate and goes around the country actually speaking um, on beef and meat consumption and some of the biggest misconceptions that exist. Of course, as I just said that, um, this is a very controversial podcast because some people have very, um, I guess you could say strong opinions about meat consumption. You have obviously the carnivore keto, um, advocates, which are all in pro of that, but also not, a, or kind of against, or not necessarily against, but they don't essentially consume many vegetables or plant-based sources that you obviously have the vegan and plant-based community, which are more about against meat consumption and carbo carbon footprint and ethical considerations and all these different things. We try today to take a neutral stand. We try not to be white or black, but be more in the gray area of it, which a lot of times balance is what defines that. It doesn't really come as a sexy word as actually trying to, to take a stand or be polarized in some areas. So today we try to be as neutral as we could talking about meat, talking about red meat, carbon footprint, we actually dove deep into understanding the differences that exist between grass or a grass finished and grass fed beef. We went deep into the nutritional component of it, the differences that exist between omega-3 content of it, how to choose the proper cuts of beef, um, the proper portions of it, and many, many other Thanks. Nicole is a smart cookie and she delighted us with a lot of information here today. And there's a lot of resources that she shared that you're going to find down in the show notes if you want to go and read more about some of her amazing blog posts that she's had on her website. But also, if you want to learn more about beef and beef research, she also shared some really great resources. Before we, um, or I let you get on to the podcast, I wanted to remind you that we have still some um, signups available for the free intermittent fasting course that is available on my website. Make sure that you grab one of those if you haven't yet. It's going to remain free just for a few more signups before it turns into a paid course. We've had great reviews from it. People are learning a ton. This is intermittent fasting explained from the perspective of a registered dietitian in over 50 plus minutes of um, content in the form of video delivered to your email on a weekly basis for the duration of it. So I'm excited to bring that to you. Work super hard for it. And it's very um, didactic. So you'll learn a ton and a lot of applications that go with it. And there's a lot of bonuses that would come along the way. So make sure that if you haven't yet, go and grab it. Without further ado, I leave you to my conversation with Nicole Rodriguez on beef and meat consumption. See you guys next week and have an amazing day. 
What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Even Nutrition Radio. I did a little happy dance. I'm gonna go with, like one of my colleagues, like Tony Castillo. He does like he's like the dancing dietitian. Uh, so if you guys can see us, um, I am super delighted to have my friend and colleague Nicole Rodriguez on the podcast. Welcome, Nicole. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Andres? Good, good, good. I was actually looking at you. We were talking earlier. I was like, you're ready to you play Fortnite right now with your headphones and your headset. I love it. It's normally what I do around this time on a Wednesday. <laughs> so That's special awesome. day though. <laughs> cool. So why don't you tell me a little bit more about yourself so people and the listeners can can kind of find out about you? We we're talking earlier that I called you the beef dietitian and we're gonna get uh, we're gonna dive deep into the reasoning why that or or why that is. But why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, for sure. So I am a registered dietitian and certified personal trainer. I live in Long Island, New York, about an hour outside of Manhattan. In my regular day-to-day -day life, I help folks make easy work out of meal prep so that they could fuel their active and you know maybe aspiring to be more active lifestyles. And somewhere along the lines in my journey, I stumbled upon this interest in agriculture, or maybe I should say revisited this interest in agriculture. And some of that has led us to our conversation today about beef. That's awesome. Now, where is your, where is your background from? Are you, because obviously you will have a Latino background, uh, but I was just curious because I've always seen your last name. I was like, is she Puerto Rican, Dominican, or oh, where, where? What is she? You know what? This is where I trip people up. I am... I am Latin by marriage, and I am mother to uh, a young Latina. So my husband is Puerto Rican Cuban. Okay, and I've been and that's, you know, your, most, that's your like married name. Yes, it's yeah. my married name. I've been immersed in that culture for a solid eleven eleven years now. You do have the looks, though. You you know I could I could. That's what people people think that I people think that I pass. My background's really Mediterranean, uh, Cypriot, and Italian. Oh wow. Okay, so maybe that's what it what it comes from. Now you do yeah. you speak Spanish. Because I don't, I don't think I told you, but I'm, we're gonna do the second part of this podcast. It's gonna be in Spanish. But also, oh, I better, I better keep. Going. <laughs> <laughs> Poquito, pero mm, tomé las clases para todos los años en la escuela. Pero cuando fue a la universidad, tomé las clases de italiano y I don't know how to say it in Spanish, but oh, I got bro, you, you, confused good. it. I, you, I need to pick right. it back up. <laughs> That's awesome. Next time we'll do a podcast and we'll do this. And we'll try to, we'll try to swing it in Spanish. So <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much again for being here. And and I, I have followed your um your Instagram for a while and we communicated in the past. And I think, you know, to kind of like start things off, you know, with a bang, uh, the the biggest thing that I that I noticed from you is that you're an avid supporter of beef and beef consumption and kind of getting or get the truth out as far as like the a lot of the misconceptions that exist around that. And I feel like I wanted to know where that fascination for beef started. Like, you know, is there like you always loved red meat and, and since you were like a little or like, did you have like a, like an agricultural background or where is that kind of like fascination for learning more about this and educating people? Because I've seen you like, you get your hands dirty, girl, you go in <laughs> arms and you go in all this kind of stuff. So where did, I come, where, where did it all come from? So I grew up with a mom who was a little bit more, I would say, flexitarian. We definitely ate mostly plant forward, I would say, growing up. But I have always, I've always loved beef. But during my dietetic internship, I attended our state annual meeting, NISDA. And I'm sure you've been in Florida, right? And there's the big convention hall and tablings and different educational opportunities. And I met this woman, Cindy Chan Phillips, and she is the dietitian for the New York Beef Council. And I was just fascinated by her. I was surprised because I, I think you could agree that in certain circles, talking about and promoting consumption of any meat is a bit controversial. And I loved the way she presented and took some materials home and read and, you know, kind of shelved it for a couple of years. And then a couple of years later, she reached out to me after I had passed my exam and she had stumbled upon one of my blog, blog posts where I was discussing, I believe, the differences between grain finished and grass finished under this umbrella idea of 
let's not shame people about their choices and let's shop in, in peace at the grocery store. She invited me out on a tour and I met actual ranchers and people who are on the cow calf side of things, you know, mothers and babies and a few other people within the industry. And I was just blown away by how much, for lack of a better word, love goes into this profession of raising these animals that we get nutrition from. So I, from there, I decided to take the Master of Beef Advocacy course just on my own accord because I was interested and continued to just do a little bit of my own investigation and see where some of the misconceptions were and went on a few more tours. I ended up uh, being invited out to Denver where beef headquarters is for top of the class training. Those are people who they deem to be really involved in spreading the truth about beef. And, um, you know, one thing just kind of led to another as far as my, as far as my interests and it's all really really fascinating to me. That's awesome. No, and I, and I think uh, if there's somebody that knows the stuff about this and why I wanted to have you on podcast is because you can definitely elaborate and, and kind of take a, a neutral stand in all this. Because when you go on and you literally like, you know, type in and, and go on Netflix, you'll find all these documentaries on sometimes on both sides. But I feel like the biggest one that resonates with the most, you know, with people the most. And I feel like it was, you know, a shocking change in, in the way people ate specifically beef and meat consumption. What, you know, I think it was like the one called forks over knives. Um, and some of those documentaries that in my opinion, a lot of times they have an agenda, they're trying to prove a point. Uh, but then at the same time, when you look at, there's another one that was more keto supportive. Um, it was more, it was, I think it was called like the magic pill it would actually took a stand in the opposite way. So when we look at the stances that exist right now and you have like the, the plant-based vegan community and you have the keto community and you have all this, like um, in some ways they can become cults trying to push one or the other. You know, I guess like the, the, the first thing is like, what are your thought, your thoughts on this when you look at this and, and what are like the, the biggest kind of message that you try to get across whenever somebody takes a really strong stand on one side or the other. Yes. The, you raise such great points there. At, and, and I speak about this a lot that the extremes can sound very dogmatic. It becomes almost religious. And a great example of that is, as I went to a debate between, or do you know, Dr. David Katz? Sounds familiar. Yeah, you, yes. you probably, yeah. you probably know his name and yeah. he's, uh, he's, I would say he's an advocate for a plant forward diet, but he's yeah, also, he mm-hmm. he's also a really highly regarded physician. He was the creator of the Nuval system, which rated the, uh, the health benefits of various foods across the grocery store. And he was debating a woman named Nina Techholtz. She's the author of Big Fat Surprise. Mm-hmm. And she has a very strong following in the keto and carnivore communities. And the, the debate itself was, was very heated and almost uncomfortable. But what surprised me the most were the people in the audience getting up in support of one or the other and the questions that they asked. And some of the supporters from the keto and carnivore camp, if you will, were going so far as to say, well, plants are poisoning us. Like, oh, oh, hold on a second. So it's, it gets very, very heated and, and almost religious because there's a sense of community, right? So I always take it back to like, what does the data actually tell us? Obviously, everyone needs to eat more plants, specifically fruits and vegetables, because we know that only one in 10 Americans are getting the requirements, right? Uh, We also know that consumption of fruits and vegetables has been flat for a really long time. We're not seeing an increase. We also know that we could say the same about meat. So we're actually over the past 20 years, we're not eating more meat. It hovers somewhere around 220 pounds per capita, you know, per person for a year, but that's been flat for about 20 years. So, you know, really my messaging is don't, feel badly if you are already eating meat, but are you also eating enough vegetables? Does that make sense? Yeah. So 
I think a lot of people hear beef and they make assumptions like, oh yeah, I'm going to go totally carnivore and never eat a plant again. Or, or they hear plant-based and think that that must exclude animal products from your diet. And I think there's really room on your plate for everything and to feel good about those choices, whether, whether it's chicken or it's beef or it's pork, or if it's a mix of all of those things. But again, we need to, I think we need to do a better job of preaching the balance. Like it doesn't mean just cause you're eating that you're not filling the other part of your plate yeah. with hopefully, hopefully some leafy greens and other vegetables that you enjoy and that make you feel good. Yeah. And I think, I think people like, I think balance is just not a sexy term for a lot of people. So yeah. they just prefer to kind of go and stick to a specific belief system and, or, or a specific group of people that they really share the same kind of like viewpoints and, and us dietitians that try to stand in the middle and say, Hey, everything can fit. And we don't have to go one or we don't have to be so polarizing. Then people are like, oh, that's kind of boring. I want to be part of like this cool group of people that says, <laughs> you know, eating meat for breakfast, lunch and dinner with absolutely no vegetable consumption. That sounds a pretty cool thing to do. And this is the way I'm going to live to be 200 years. And the same thing can be said of like the, the veganism and, and plant based eaters. They're like, you know, this is the, the kind of like way to. And obviously both of them will find the arguments and the research. That's the thing. Like they, on both sides, you'll find research to support your, your hypothesis, to support your views. And so it's really difficult to have like debates like the one that you're talking about, which I've seen some bits and pieces of it. And it gets heated because you will have convincing data from both sides. But then, you know, what do you, the way you interpret it, I feel like it makes a difference, right? I mean, you can cherry pick all day long, right? And unfortunately, that's what sells magazines that's what's quote unquote sexy and the idea of balance as you said or what i speak to my clients if you want to make them really uncomfortable what i call living in the gray that not everything is black and white and it's it's a good place to get comfortable living in the gray but it's it's really hard to accept and it's definitely not the sexy cell of black and white extremes. yeah i think that makes a big difference yeah now right. if we go more into I guess like I'm trying to figure out how we want to kind of take this conversation so we kind of like do it in a step process. So first of all, like I, I like to make this super practical for people so they can kind of like imagine and apply certain things. So when you go to a grocery store and you go to the meat section, one of the biggest terms that you mentioned earlier was, and, and now this like, they're all like the more super health advocates. They're always looking that they consume red meats and they go, no, you need to buy grass fed. You need to buy grass fed beef. That's like, you know, the, the purest, the most organic, the best way to get it. But recently I've been starting to hear this term known as grass finished that people may not be some of them may be aware of it, but they don't understand exactly the differences. So, and I think like the big chunk of this conversation is going to surround on the, about this around this. So why don't you kind of tell us a little bit more about those two terms? What do they mean? Let's maybe start by kind of like making the definition so people understand exactly what we're going to go through and then maybe like explain the differences that exist. And as far as like meat sourcing specifically here in the U S yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. So as far as grass and grain are concerned, it's important to recognize that all beef, regardless of the finish, all of those cattle spend the majority of their lives feeding on grass. So the difference in a grain finished a beef product, it's only 11% of their total lifetime diet is grain. So most of the rest of their diet over the course of their lifetime is grass, um, other inedible forage similar to grass and things like that. And it's really just that last, let's call it 10% that's grain. So it's not a huge difference uh, as between the two. Now, if it's grass finished, then he's, that cattle spends his entire life cycle on grass. But there are a couple of catches. So that cattle will take about two times longer to finish. So he is, it takes him longer to pack on the meat on his bones necessary to go to slaughter. Um, so that's, that's one difference. And that's where we get into that kind of environmental piece, you know, which one is better for the environment and there's arguments for both. So, you know, nutritionally, what are some of the things that you've, the common misconceptions that you hear between grain finished and 
grass finished. For me, I think, well, I guess like the, the bigger question, so I make sure I understand it correctly. You're saying that all cattle in the U.S., they are fed uh, grass. Like they should, the difference that exists is just like the very last part of like their cycle. Um, so exactly. saying that all, every, all kinds of meat that are sourced, at least in the U S like they're basically fed the same thing. It's just more the big, the, the very end of their lives really, that makes a difference between a full grass fed, you know, beef and then the grass finish. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly okay. it. Got it. Okay. So that's a big thing. So I think the biggest things that I heard more about like in the grass fed, it's like, it's more of like uh, the, the stuff that I hear from uh, some clients that kind of tell me about it is, um, it's more of a pure, like there's like less um, additives into it. There's obviously like more, um, like, you know, the quality of the meat is better. Those are usually the things that I hear the most. But to be honest, I'm not super familiar with all like that goes into it or like the differences nutritionally that exist. So I would love to for you to shed some light on all this. Yeah, for sure. So uh, there's, if, if you do a blind taste test, you will definitely have people who prefer that grass finished flavor. I would would say, you know, for lack of a better word, it's a bit more grassy. It's a bit more earthy tasting. Uh, a grain finished, there it will have a slightly higher fat content, so it's a little richer. But most of that fun of that fat content is monounsaturated fat. That's like where the difference is. So as far as being more like pure tasting, I think that's up for debate. As far as additives, you can look for labels that say, uh, you know, no, no beef in your food system is going to test with antibiotic residues at all, right? So I think that's something that people talk about as well. So there is, if cattle needs to be treated with antibiotics, then there's a withdrawal period. And by time it gets to slaughter, it's going to be out of the cow system and therefore out of its body. Right. I'm so I'm guessing is one of the things that people talk about, right. Yes. Antibiotic treatments of beef and stuff like that. And another, you know, reasoning what people say, you need to stay away from it. Uh, right. Exactly. So that's another misconception I hear a lot, but grass finish does not necessarily mean never ever treated with antibiotics either. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of labeling and honestly, a lot of it doesn't really affect the end quality of the product that you're buying. You can really feel confident buying anything in a U.S. supermarket as far as beef's concerned, really as far as any meat's concerned, and know that it's free of antibiotics at the point of sale and that it's also, a, what do you want, like a wholesome product and a well-raised product. So those are some of the other misconceptions, I think, where grass finished comes in. I think there's a misconception about that antibiotic piece. I don't know if that's something you've heard. Okay. And, and well. I guess I also wanted to know about like the USDA organic seals and I sometimes see in beef, like, does that have anything to do with the, the way that, you know, the, the, the life cycle of, of, or the way that the, it's a slaughter or the way that it is treated or the whole grass fed versus grass finished. Cause I've seen it in some, um, some stores, you go to Walmart, you go to Publix, like you have like that kind of like organic, uh, seal on it. Is that something that you tend to see often? And the what does that mean? Feed? So, so the organic seal that has to do with the feed that wouldn't have anything to do necessarily with the animal itself, but how he is fed. So that would mean he's receiving organic feed, I believe through the entire course of his life cycle. So whether he's grass finished or he's grain finished, that would all have to be certified organic. Just like if you're buying, if you're buying a vegetable in the store that's certified organic, it would be the same as, as his feed. Does that make sense? So, yeah, his so it's more of like the certified. farm and then the ranches that they're at that they're actually like, so this actually goes a, a, a step forward saying like, okay, like the, the grass that is grown in this specific farm, it's actually full organic. They don't use or whatever, like the, the standards maybe for that, like the, the whole pesticide stuff and all that kind of stuff. It's more about what the cattle is being fed um, from, from that perspective. Exactly. We could okay. have a whole other talk one day about pesticides, but I do want to point out that just because something is organic does not mean it's not sprayed with pesticides. There are more than a dozen that are approved for use in organic farming. Organic so that's a whole other 
a whole other misconception, <laughs> but you know, something else to stick in the back of your mind for another time. <laughs> Good chat. Okay, no, yeah, we're definitely going to have to bring you back to talk about <laughs> that because I know you've talked about this in the past. Um, now, nutritionally speaking, I know you mentioned that grass fit and grass finish, the nutritional differences that exist are very minimal. Is there a difference that exists that you know or are aware of um, when you combine or when you compare organic fed, like, uh, organically fed, you know, cattle versus, you know, the one that is not, because obviously there's a big difference in price when you buy it at a supermarket. So is it worth it? Right. That's such a great question. So unfortunately there's not data to support nutritional differences between organic and something that's conventional. Uh, but that is a certification that costs, that costs the farmers, right? So it, you do see that price difference in your meat cooler. Uh, I just wanted to go back real briefly, if we can, to those minor differences between grass finished and grain finished, because something I hear a lot of people say is the omega-3 content yeah. is a lot higher. It's so tiny. It's a difference of on grass, it's 0. 0.04 grams per hundred grams and on grain at 0 0.02. So does, and that's per hundred grams. So it's tiny. So you might hear claims such as, oh, but the grass fed beef has twice as many omega threes, which would be correct. But when we're speaking in nanograms, it's not really, it's not really significant. Yeah, that's kind of like when we're saying like, you know, like broccoli has like seven times the amount, I don't remember the statistics, seven times the amount of protein that it has in beef when you compare it, like, you know, when you like compare them by weight and, and it just doesn't really kind of make sense and really not considering the water content of certain things. Right, right? right. So, or how much you'd have to consume, absolutely. Yeah, to get the same amount. Okay, that's awesome. Now, let's talk about more of... Uh, I guess like meat sourcing and, and farming practices, because I feel like there's, there's a, there's a big conversation going around around, on, around this, which is going to be, and then we'll get a little bit more in the carbon footprint and stuff, which I know there's another uh, entire debate on all that. So when you visited these farms, like what are some of the difference that did you find from, I guess, like, can you tell the difference between good versus not so good farming practices as far as meat sourcing? Or is there standards that um, ranchers usually follow for the right, you know, for raising cattle the right way? Um, and, and some of those practices as far as like, you know, when we're choosing, you know, meat at a supermarket or a steakhouse and places like that. Yeah, so the entire beef community in the United States participates in what's called the uh, BQA. It's the Beef Quality Assurance Program. And without getting too deep into it, that's really the industry set of standards as far as sustainability, animal welfare, stewardship of the environment, specifically talking about sustainability. So those benchmarks and standards are there for the community to, to follow. Um, but something I've just learned firsthand is that when you walk onto a ranch, a sign that the cows are happy or that they're more or less quiet. So you think you go somewhere and hear a lot of mooing, right? But I got there, I was like, um, this is really, this is really quiet. Why is it so, why aren't they mooing? Like, where's my full effect, right? But happy cows are quiet cows. So it's just as you'd imagine, idyllic and you know, the rolling hills, if you're visiting a cow-calf operation or where they're still feeding on grass, right? You get to see all that. But what has really surprised me is that the feed lots, uh, and that's where a grain-finished cattle, that's where he would go for that last bit of his life to put on some more heft. Those are really quiet as well. Uh, they are given ample water, ample feed, they're cared for, and they just seem overall happy and they're not really bothered by you being there so much. So that's yeah. something I, I found pretty interesting as well. There's not a, there's not a fear of humans. Okay. which is another sort of misconception that, that I've seen floated around. So, you know, from what I've seen, and now I've been to half a dozen ranches and a couple of processing plants where the actual slaughter takes place, 
they all they all look happy and they're peaceful. They're just kind of chilling out and eating, to be honest. They're doing their job, which is to- um, yeah. And I think like you know, like those documentaries that kind of show like the it's just it's the way that they present it. And I feel like yes. it's like the way that they kind of put it out there. They don't really show the whole story of everything. So that's the, a picture out of context can be interpreted in so many different ways, unfortunately. So. You know, it's it's rare to see what really goes on for a lot of different reasons. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, let's talk about carbon footprint because this is a big area of debate, uh, especially from you know the plant based community because they say, and there's been reports that you know we're going to our world is going to die if we keep eating meat because of like the carbon footprint that exists. But then also on the other hand. There's also been some, some some data showing that, you know, without that, that obviously there's some risk of without the, the meat, without the cattle. So I am actually not too familiar with all this. So what are some your, your perspectives? I know you did a great uh, blog post and I'm sure I'm going to link it up on the show notes uh, so can, people can read it. But why don't you kind of give some perspective on, on all this as far as like the carbon footprint um, from, from both sides, you know, what are some like the, the good, what are some like, what's like the, the I guess like the, the pretty or what is it called? Like the, the ugly and, and all that kind of stuff within, you know, that the whole aspect of environment or sustainability and like the environment aspect of, of, of beef and, and all that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I just want to be really clear. I, I don't think anyone, I mean, I'm sure you run into your some of your female clients who could benefit from a little more animal-based protein from time to time, right? Because I know I encounter that with women. Yeah. But I think as a whole in developed nations, we probably don't need to eat more meat but we also don't necessarily need to eat less. And there are definitely underdeveloped countries that would really benefit from the nutrition that some of these animal proteins provide. So I I think that's just an important thing to recognize that without it, we might have micronutrient deficiencies and it would be hard to make up the balance. So from a carbon footprint perspective, there's a lot of different ways to look at this, but there's a great paper from Whiten Hall, I believe 2017. And what they found is that if the entire United States went completely vegan, it would result in like a less than 3% reduction in the U.S.'s carbon footprint. So that's not accounting for, uh, we would have to assume all the cattle are dead. So then what are we doing with those cattle? We also have to figure out what would we do with that land? Because a lot of the a lot of the pasture where cattle graze, it's not quite suitable for farming. Uh, for farming for other vegetation. So then that's sort of a wash, right? What are we doing with this with this land? Um, and then we're not taking into account once again how are we going to compensate for all of the nutrients our population is missing from not eating meat because that can become, I'm sure if you work with anyone who's vegan, it can be a a big challenge to fill in some of those nutrient gaps. So I think it's sort of a pie in the sky idea to think let's all go vegan and all of our problems will go away from a greenhouse gas emission perspective. And, you know, there's some research that shows there's a guy in Australia who specializes in this. I should know his name better. But the way that this grazing impacts the land is actually is actually good for the environment, that it actually helps offset some emissions. So that's another thing to consider. Um, And really overall, I think it's important to recognize that like plants need animals and animals need plants. Yeah, it's, it's it's a balanced ecosystem. Absolutely, because plants need manure to to grow and to thrive, right? That offers a lot of nutrition to the soil. And of course, these animals need plants to eat and to, you know, they need to upcycle those plants and turn it into this efficient source of protein. So there are a lot of different ways to look at it, but I don't think it's going to solve all of our problems to go vegan tomorrow. 
Yeah, and I think I think a lot of people kind of clink clink on to, for example, like the the perspective of like, oh, there are blue zones in the U.S., which or in the world that they're only plant based, and but then there's also other areas that they only eat meat and they very eat very little consumption of vegetables because of like the locations and you know when they're looking at like the Eskimos and people that live in northern areas. So it's really difficult. It's it's all the context that you place it on, but I feel like a lot of people fail to see the 10,000 feet view. Um, they just kind of like look at it like in a very segmented and very specific areas. And I feel like a lot of times when we don't look at the broader perspective as an ecosystem that the earth is like, they don't, they kind of fail to see really what we're trying, like the message that we're trying to convey. I feel like there's, there's, it's like you said, it's like the perspective that you decide to look at it. So. Absolutely. And when we, when we look at the bigger picture of our lifestyles, there are a lot of things that we can do individually aside from what's on our plate, you know, uh, in, in certain areas, using public transportation, choosing to walk or bike when you can, instead of driving and turning your lights off, all of these little carbon footprint things that we could be doing on our own to make a large impact are just as important as how we choose to you know, outfit our plates a bit. So I think it's all, it's all relevant. Okay. This is great. Um, let's switch gears. Let's talk about um, the consumer and choosing, or like, I like to make it more practical in a way that maybe the steps that you personally follow to choosing your red meats. And I think we can go here on three specific, you know, we're looking at it from three different perspectives because we can look at it from the health perspective. We can look at it from caloric perspective and we can look at it from also the cost perspective. So when you look into each individual one of those areas, you know, what is like the, I guess like the step process that you kind of follow personally to in the way that you kind of teach your clients for choosing meats. I think you'd be pretty like helpful for people to understand exactly. Well, if I just, you know, what just more, I'm not looking to like lose weight. I'm just looking to just be healthier. You know, what's like the, the process that would do versus somebody that is like really trying to, you know, like be mindful of calories and all kinds of stuff like this, you know, kind of what would you tell that person as far as like, you know, step process or like some of the things you would recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a couple of key words you can look for on the label of beef. Uh, sirloin and round, those are two really easy things to look out for, for a leaner cut of beef. I would also say if I'm, I think we get sticker shock when we look in the meat case sometimes, right? Because it's the pricier area. That's where a larger proportion of our grocery bill is spent. So if I'm looking at a at a pound, I should be looking at that like, okay, this is going to give me four servings. So if I'm feeding my family of four tonight, that's done and everyone is going to get an appropriate serving, you know, between three and four ounces cooked, right? Um, so those are the two words I would look out for. I also refer to beefitswhatsfordinner.com because they have all of the cuts broken down if you want to get into specific cuts that follow the criteria that actually are some of them are approved by the American Heart Association as meeting guidelines for either lean or very lean cuts if that's what you're after. Um, but I would say on a, on a more like larger scale, if you're cooking in bulk, I would say be a little bit less concerned about looking for percentages in your ground beef because those, I'm sure you've seen like that, that 93.7 or that 95.5, it can be significantly more expensive than an 85.15, which means 15% fat. But if you go through the process of sauteing that beef and then draining it through a colander and rinsing it actually before you season it, you're getting that 95.5 profile, that really lean profile, but you've spent a lot less money. So that's another one I like to convey is just, you know, get, get some of that initial fat off in the cooking and rinsing process. So those are my tips specifically for shopping for cuts, um, really portioning, looking for those lean keywords 
and then looking a bit beyond the label on ground beef to get more bang for your buck, get more for your money. Okay. That's a good one for the cost perspective. Cause I know when I'm going to in the grocery store, I tend to look at, you know, the ground sirloin or like the, the super like lean type of like beef, like I guess from like the caloric perspective. Um, and, and I think that makes like a bigger impact. Now you mentioned something about, like, I think, and I, I don't want to ever get, I don't like to get political on any of this, but I know that there are certain recommendations according to like, you know, the American Heart Association and, and things of that sort. You know, do you think like the research goes in hand with the recommendations that are established in some of these big organizations? Or is there a gap that you feel needs to be filled at this point? Yeah, it's such, it's such a great question because I think the, the research is always changing, right? We're always, we're always learning more, but a reference that I always go back to with a really, I wrote, unfortunately, really strong cancer history in my whole family tree. So I always look back to those, um, American cancer guidelines and their guidelines are to not exceed 18 ounces of red or processed meat per week. So if we take 18 ounces across seven days, you could still be having what five, almost six servings of red beef. And that's just staying under the recommend guidelines for, you know, hopefully cancer prevention. Um, and I think I think that is I think that's reasonable. I don't think going beyond a, a for most people, I don't think going beyond a three ounce or four ounce serving at dinner is really necessary because that three to four ounces is providing around that twenty five to thirty sweet spot grams of protein, right? That we're that we're all kind of preaching as being a good amount. Um, and then that leaves room throughout the rest of your day for other sources of protein that can provide that same sort of, you know, bolus of 25 to 30 grams. So I, uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to say like, oh, are we, are we going to change the guidelines again? A lot of people have a problem with the dietary guidelines. I, I think usually they, they are pretty reasonable. And the takeaway message there is always eat more fruits and vegetables, keep an eye on your added sugar and, and mind your salt content, right? And minding these processed foods. And I, I think we've kind of strayed away from hard and fast recommendations on what your actual portion should look like on meats. But I think those cancer guidelines are, are I, think, I think they're fair. No, and I agree. And I think, would you, wouldn't you say that there's also like a misconception that exists between the interpretation that, that happens as far as like cancer um, causing or cancer related, like the correlational uh, things on, on cancer and red meat consumption? Because I think there's a key word that a lot of people tend to miss, which is processed. Yes. Um, and I feel like that's a big, big part of it. So what are your, th what are your thoughts on this? Because I feel like a lot of people they look at a piece of red meat and they're like, oh, that's going to cause cancer. That's like your correlation to cancer if you know depending on who you're asking and you know is it more is it the actual nice juicy like straight up piece of beef or is it like the processed stuff that comes out of you know beef processing you know i guess from the you know, yeah I'm trying to ask Absolutely. So I, I think, you know, above all else, we need to look at entire lifestyle, right? We need to look at things like, are, are you are you also smoking? Are you also inactive? You know, are you leading the sedentary lifestyle? And then are you, instead of choosing that nice lean cut of beef that we maybe talked about, is it pepperoni? Is it hot dogs? Is it something that came out of 7-Eleven that, you know, is it, is it quote unquote meat or is it like a, this meat like substance that's made of animals? And I, I'm not going to say I don't like a good like piece of chorizo and serrano ham once in a while, but if, if those processed meats are your norm and not the exception, then yeah, I do. Uh, I do believe that's going to be a, a stronger correlation. You're putting yourself at a higher at higher risk. So, and there's, there's research that would refute that as well. Right. But do, do you think anyone needs to eat more hot dogs? I, I don't think so. I think, <laughs> I think that the more we do to reduce those kinds of habitual lifestyle choices where that processed meat is the first choice, I think the more we do to reduce that choice, the better, but as far as, you know, like actual whole wholesome beef, chicken, pork, that's all correlational and not particularly strong, but you can, and you can link anything with cancer now. Yeah. 
That's <laughs> right. It, it basically feels I like. I can't do anything without it being linked to, to me probably it. getting cancer. That's awesome. Um, let's talk, like, you know, just because I want to be respectful of your time. And, and I, there's a part of it that I feel like a lot of people maybe wonder. It's like, okay, you talked a lot about beef, but, you know, we haven't really gone into detail into, like, the, the nutritional benefits specific that exist. And I feel like it'd be pretty cool to kind of break down you know, like more going into like basic nutrition, nutrition science, when you, for example, comparing, you know, beef versus all the kinds of meats, you know, what are some of the things that kind of like, and, and I think you posted, and I'm going to also link it up on the, on the show notes, like a really cool, like infographic that kind of shows some of like the more nutritional highlights that the beef provides, um, comparatively speaking to maybe other foods. And I'm not kind of like refine other things compared to beef as a protein source, but what are some of the, the things that people miss out on whenever they don't get red or enough like red meat consumption um, that they could benefit from? Yeah, so I think you're re you're referring to the Beef's Big Ten infographic, which is amazing. Yeah. And when you link up my blog post, I believe that's in there. So mm -hmm. we always think of the big three being zip, zinc, iron, and protein. So those are like the top three that beef is, is really rich in. But we already know there are other protein sources, right? So it's your selenium and your B vitamins. And those are some of the nutrients that you'll get more of in beef as opposed to some other protein choices. So it is a well-rounded protein, and I think that speaks to what I like to call the S factor in beef that, you know, what I find anecdotally with clients and with, my, with myself and my own family, all of those other proteins are great, but when you choose beef, beef, there's a little bit more of a satisfaction factor. Maybe part of it is mental. Maybe part of that is those added nutrients um, that you might find yourself a little less inclined after that meal occasion is finished to go and seek out something else. Does that make sense? Yeah, Do you ever feel like, like you have dinner and then you're like, Oh, I'm not really satisfied. So I'm going to go and reach for something else. And, you know, I think with, I think with beef, that's a little less likely to occur because that satisfaction in there. Yeah. So I know you work with a lot of, I, you work with an athletic population yeah quite a bit so um you know th that iron obviously it's fantastic incredible. and some of those other nutrients support brain health so it's it's all there in one nice little package and it's at a really low caloric cost right you could have um I think it's around 150 calories for a lean serving of beef is packing in a lot of that nutrition where if you're trying to get it from other sources, you're going to end up spending a lot more calories, so to speak. Yeah. And I think I want to go back to what you said about portioning, because I feel like that is like the biggest um, area that a lot of people don't quite understand because you're talking about like a three to four ounce uh, serving or, or like an 18 ounces of beef, I guess is like the typical guideline or recommendation per week. But the problem is that we go to like steakhouses and, and places where, you know, there's a lot of beef consumption and there's no, like the smallest like serving is going to be like, and very rarely you'll see like a six ounce yeah. uh, like sirloin. And it's more predominant to see like 12 plus ounces. So I think a lot of times like the misconception that comes from like a low um perspective of what beef beef provides it comes down to like portion is that something that you encounter often yeah absolutely i think there's a misconception that everyone is out at the steakhouse doing like you know the the 72 ounce steak and trying to win a t-shirt or something like that um what the what the latest research from beef shows about consumers is that when we're at a steakhouse like we're, if we're at the meat counter we're really concerned about protein cost taste nutrition, things like that. When we're out at the steakhouse, really that taste is our prime driver because if we're out, it's seen as a treat, right? So, you know, there's, there's a couple of ways to skirt that. So for example, you mentioned probably the smallest thing you're going to get is a filet. And if you're lucky to find a six ounce, if not, it's an eight ounce, do the right thing and enjoy half of that, slice it thin, take that other half home. That's going to make an amazing topping for a, a salad the next day that you could enjoy and get more bang for your buck. So, you know, I think the messaging is 
let's like maybe chill out when we're, when we're out on those dining occasions and not, not go so crazy on the portioning and really do our best to be responsible with those portions when we're at home, because then we are doing better for the environment, right? If we are eating according to portion, we're wasting less food because we know that if it goes in our fridge, unfortunately, maybe, maybe we're not going to eat so much of it after, right? So yeah. let's buy an appropriate portion to feed our family, to feed ourselves and, and keep it small. Know that it's about the uh, size of a deck of cards or the palm of your hand. That's a yeah. guide that you could take that you could take anywhere. Yeah. And then this, that's, that's a hard thing to always ask somebody because it's, you know, they go to, like, I was having a conversation with, you know, one of my clients last night and it's, you know, how can you ask somebody that is so used to having those like bigger portions and like, you know, looking forward to that big juicy steak. And I think it's also a cultural thing as far as, you know, like in the U S like portions are, you know, historically, historically known to be higher than other places. I remember I grew up in Venezuela and, and we would go to a steakhouse. Yes, there were obviously big bigger chunks of beef, but, you know, being served, but it was not the norm. You would have to pay a good amount of money for that. And, you know, and I feel like that bigger kind of cut of steak would be like, I feel like at the time it was like a metric system. We're talking about like 250 grams, which would be like, you know, like eight ounces, which is, you know, that was the biggest. So I feel like that's, that's something that now it's like, you know, what can you get for like, like, or you get the most for the least amount of money spent. So I feel like that people like add like, you know, they put the value in like the pricing or, or like the, the, you know, the, the ticket on there. And I feel like that's obviously like the, the bigger problem that exists. And, and I feel like that leads to a lot of the conversations about meat consumption and, and people eating too much of it. Because of, you know, you, you're talking about 18 ounces, like, you know, per week, like you go to like a couple of steakhouses, like on a, on a weekly basis, and you're probably going like, you know, at least like three times over that. If you normally get like that 12 ounce, like, you know, ribeye or, or like the, the, the New York strip or whatever, maybe the case, right? Yeah. I, I, that's just an epidemic in our culture. This bigger is better and, you know, give me more, more, more for my money. And of, of course we love value and we love to save, uh, but I think we're not really thinking of the potential costs later of overwhelming our systems and yeah. not doing best by our bodies by trying to trying to get value now. Um, it's I think it, it might cost you later. Just not make you feel great later. Yeah. I, you know, I think those portion guidelines exist for a reason. Yeah. And um, the, the following part of it is like the part of the, the, the one that people struggle the most. Yeah. And then partnering it with just, you know, going back to the, the culture in which you were raised, I'm sure that even on an occasion where you did say overindulge or have a little bit extra in, in countries like yours, there is a lifestyle supporting that there is an active lifestyle and, and less of a focus on these huge portions as the norm. And and, and that's an issue here that we are pairing us an overall sedentary lifestyle with this desire for more, more, more. Yeah, I agree. One thing I didn't ask you, I totally forgot when we we're talking about cuts. What is like the ones that the types of meat that you personally try to avoid because of, again, fat content or they just like it's not worth your either calories or like the health perspective or just too much saturated fat that it's not worth it even for like a four ounce um serving so what are some of those like the 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 ones that you try to be cautious about as far as cuts of beef yeah that's a that's a great question so it's not really a specific cut but when i'm at the meat counter because sometimes i want something with a little more fat for a like a slow roast or something like that but i look a I try to avoid that outside layer of fat. Like some intra marbling is great for flavor, uh, but that fat that surrounds a cut that you might see, I try to avoid cuts that have too much. Or if I want to make the purchase, I'll take it home and I'll sort of butcher that off myself and yeah. take away that outside layer. I think it's a it's a good rule of thumb to just not seek that out so often or if yeah. you do purchase it to trim it away yeah i feel like it's like a visual thing also to look at some of those things and you can tell you know when certain cuts of beef are going to be more predominantly higher in, in fact because absolutely absolutely i think it's really it's a really easy visual cue and and i'll say the same thing for pork um 
you know, again, being, being married to someone Puerto Rican, like a big thing I've always cooked is pernil for my husband. And that's, you know, the big, the big cut of pork shoulder. And that's this big flap of fat yes. over it. And it's, I love that. Yeah, and it's, and it's delicious, but I think you make some small swaps to things like that. And I season it the same. And now, you know, I'll take like a, a lean pork loin and season it the same way. And a lot of that flavor can still pre- be preserved. So I think if you're used to those fattier cuts, give something leaner a try with the same seasonings and maybe make your side dish as exciting as always. And, and you won't really miss it because the beef itself has a lot of flavor. Not, it's not just in the fat. Love that. That is awesome. Well, it's been an amazing pleasure to have this conversation. The last question I wanted to ask you before we get into our rapid fire, because I'm going to tell you that in a minute, is be, um, what are some resources that you would point people to uh, specifically to learn more about this and to become um, educated um, on this kind of conversation that they wanted to read more about? Yeah, absolutely. So beefresearch.org is fantastic. There are infographics, all of the latest uh, actual papers that have come out will all be at your fingertips there. There are a couple of people I'd love to point out to on Twitter. Uh, The GHG guru, Dr. Frank Mitloner, he's fantastic. His specialty is really uh, the effect of cattle on greenhouse gas emissions. He's super well-versed in that subject. And also Dr. Sarah Place, who has studied under him. They are both really well-versed sources of information that I think everyone would enjoy. Awesome. Cool. So let's get into the fun part of this conversation, which is going to be rapid fire questions. It's sort of just like the first thing that comes to your head as we kind of like, you know, wrap up our conversation here. Okay. You ready for that? Yeah, ready. All right. I'm going to love this first one because I know you're an avid lifter. So favorite exercise, go. Oh, hip thrust. I knew it because I've seen it so many different times on your Instagram. And I'm like, I knew exactly what she's going to say. That's awesome. Second question would be, what is like your, um, a book that you would recommend or you would gift to somebody that everybody should have on their bookshelf? Oh, Food Truths by Michelle Payne. Ooh, good one. Never heard of that one before. Awesome. Check it out. I'm going to add it to my list. Great. Um, A podcast, radio show, or YouTube channel, or some sort of like educational information you would recommend people to listen to or to check it out or to just kind of have handy for as a really good, uh, reliable source of information. I'm a huge fan of Sound Bites by Melissa Joy Dobbins. She has really great guests really often. Oh, good. I'm going to, I'm going to listen. I'm going to add it to, I'm going to add it to my list. Um, Awesome. The last one, and I think we may know the answer to this too. If you could choose a food to have for the rest of your life in a desertic Island, um, what would you choose? I'm going to surprise you and say pizza. Okay. I, was gonna, <laughs> I, I thought you were going to say beef, but I guess you know, pizza is a good one. I know I have to mix it up sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Nicole, it's been an amazing pleasure to have you in here. How can people find you? How can people reach out to you, contact you, work with you, um, you know, just get in touch with you? Yeah, you can visit me at enjoyfoodenjoylife.com and you can email me there, Nicole at enjoyfoodenjoylife.com. On Instagram, I am nrodriguezrdn. Come, come hang out there too. Yes. And she has amazing content that she puts out it often. She always shows up her daughter and her training routine. So definitely go and uh, check her out over there. Uh, Nicole, it's been a pleasure to have you on Nutrition Radio. Uh, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Hey, thank you so much for listening to another episode of EV Nutrition Radio. I wanted to ask you a quick favor. Um, if you enjoyed this episode or if you enjoyed the podcast altogether, make sure you subscribe and leave us a review so we increase our visibility and we continue to reach more people and change your lifestyle through nutrition, uh, performance, fitness, and health. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you guys on the next one.